I, you all are better than coffee in the morning. <laughs> I, uh, you have to know, uh, for me, this is, I, I can't think of another room I would want to be on. This is better than, definitely better than the Senate floor. <laughs> This is how I started my career, with, with folks like the folk in this room. Uh, I was a young guy, I, 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 I was a law student, and I made my decision to move, not just to Newark, which is a beautiful city with diverse neighborhoods. Go ahead, some Newark folk here. I see they put them right here so I can look at y'all. <laughs> I moved into, into the central ward of Newark. I moved into a community rich with spirit, rich with culture, with a wealth of spirit, but, but it's a low-income community. And I began my work, uh, working with tenant leaders. And I always say I got my BA from Stanford, but my PhD from the streets of Newark, because I am not exaggerating. Some of the wisest, most learned people I've met in my life have been tenant leaders and tenant activists. Who, who had this substance that knew just things. I still remember Miss Virginia Jones, a tenant president on, on the fifth floor of the projects. Brick, Brick Towers was the name of the buildings. And I was this kid that might have had too much of a high self-regard for myself coming out of Yale Law School. I knock on a door in this tough community. I just moved in. When I was moving my stuff in, I came back to my car. My stuff was stolen. <laughs> you know, it was a tough neighborhood. And I knock on her door. And, and I hear this UCLA, UCLA linebacker sounding voice say, who is it? And I'm like, oh. And I said, Cory Booker, the door opens. I'm looking like 6'4". And then I don't see anybody. And I look down and there's Miss Jones, five feet and a smidgen inches tall. And she's like, what do you want? And I'm like, well, you know, ma'am, I'm Cory Booker. I'm, I'm from Yale Law School and I'm here to help you. And she looks at me so cynically. She looks at me and she, I, she didn't say anything, but these were her eyes said. She's like, boy, you need some help. <laughs> and so we talked. I told her about my enthusiasm. I was real earnest. And I'll never forget, she takes me, she takes me down the steps of, the, of, of, of one of the buildings, through the lobby, through the courtyard, into the middle of Martin Luther King Boulevard. And she says, if you want to help me, tell me what you see. We're going to talk a little bit about vision today. Tell me what you see. And I describe the neighborhood sort of like I've already described it to you. I described the crack house. I described the projects. I described, just describe the neighborhood. And the more I talked, the more upset this woman looked. And then finally I stopped and she just shook her head and she says, I'm sorry, you can't help me. And this elderly woman just starts walking away from me. And I'm like confused. So I run after her and I grab her from behind very respectfully. <laughs> And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she says to me, she goes, boy, you need to understand something. That the world you see outside of you is a reflection of what you have inside of you. And if you're one of these people who only sees problems and darkness, despair, that's all there's ever going to be. But if you're one of these stubborn people who every time you open your eyes, you see hope, you see opportunity, you see possibility, you see love, you see the face of God, then you can be one of the people that helps me. And, and she walks off, leaving me there, looking at my feet, thinking to myself, okay, grasshopper, thus endeth the lesson. <laughs> I, I was embraced, despite myself, embraced by a community of tenant leaders in Newark. My whole career is the result, and I don't, I'm not exaggerating this. It was a group of housing activists in Newark, New Jersey. Miss Jones, uh, Miss, Miss, uh, Miss Jackson, uh, Bill Good, uh, uh, Frank Hutchins. I can name all the names of, of these incredible uh, uh, tenant leaders, some of whom have who've passed now, who saw in me, through that site, saw in me things I didn't see in myself and taught me lessons of the spirit that I still lean on today. I would not be where I am. They, they were the ones that said to me, you need to run for city council in Newark almost 20 years ago to this day. It was May of 2000, excuse me, 1998. And, 
And, and so I want to share with you something today about, about vision. I, I, I want to talk to you about, thank you, sir. <laughs> I want to I I tell you something. I want to tell you all something about, about how we have lost our way when it comes to the vision of this country. Our, our national anthem starts with those words, oh, say can you see. And, and the problem is in America is we came up with this bold idea of America that this would be the country that every generation would do better than the one before. That, that this would be a nation that if you didn't matter what your race was or your religion was, it didn't matter who your mama or who your daddy was, if you came from a country club community or if you came from uh, the gritty streets in the inner city, that this was the nation where you could make it. That if you worked hard, played by the rules, that you could find a pathway to success. That your children could nurture their genius. That you could retire with security. That this was a country where you could have life and liberty and could pursue happiness. Now, I don't want to I don't want to whitewash or, or or sanitize American history. This was not always the case. In fact, our founders did something really interesting. They founded this nation different than any others. We are the oldest constitutional democracy. We broke with the course of human events and founded a nation not based upon tribalism or religious commonalities or racial commonalities. If you go around the globe, if you had a globe and spun it and put your finger down, you're going to find a country whose borders are formed on ethnicity, on religion, on tribalism. Countries broke apart, India and Pakistan over religious breaking apart. All those countries founded on often what the similarities were between people on those lines. We were a nation that said, hey, we're going to found ourselves because of a common set of ideals that we actually believe that all people are created equal in the eyes of God. It was about saying that we recognize the dignity and the worth and even the potential, and we know that if we join together in the human spirit, we can make something extraordinary happen. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not sanitizing history. These men that had this genius of an idea, they, they had a lot of problems too. I mean, heck, Native Americans were referred to as savages in the Declaration of Independence. Women weren't referred to at all. And, and, and listen, black folk, you know, Stokely Carmichael from the Civil Rights Movement, movement used to always go, constitu, constitu. I can only say three-fifths of the word. <laughs> but this is the exciting thing about our incredible country is the founders put these ideals out there and they basically said every generation is gonna work to make a more perfect union. And that's why activists like us in this room got together and demanded that this country live up to her promise. And, and don't make this mistake by affording historic changes to to the great man theory of America, I am telling you that is a lie. Change has not happened because these great men, four score and, you know, no. I, I love our leaders of past, the people in history books, but let me tell you right now, you are here in this tradition of American change in the understanding that change doesn't come from Washington, it comes to Washington. Some of, you, some, of you, some of you all, some of you all might be thinking, okay, oh man, that sounds good, but maybe he's, no, please, let me tell you this right now. It wasn't a bunch of men in Washington that stood around and thought to themselves, yep, yep, it's about time women have their rights. No. It was Americans across this country that fought for it, demanded for it. Many women died for it. You, let, me, let me give you another example. This man, Strom Thurmond, didn't just one day wake up and say, yep, yep, those Negro people deserve some civil rights. No, it was multi-ethnic, multi-racial coalitions coming together, fighting and bringing the change to Washington. You all are here right now in that tradition. At this time, America is falling short of its promise. 
at the time in America that we're actually losing ground. If you are a baby boomer in the United States of America, baby boomers, 90% of them did better than their parents. Financially, this idea in America that every generation does better than their next. Well, now if you're a baby, if you're a millennial, it's just a coin toss. Only about 50% doing better than their parents. And by the way, that number is even geographically constrained because prosperity in America is becoming islands of prosperity in vast sections of economic struggle. And, and everything right over here, everything is going up. Everything is going up, but wages. Wages are not keeping up with the cost of living. sinfulness in that point. There has to be a moral objection to this, that we are at a time of 85 year high in corporate profits and 65 year low in wages in America. That we have a nation right now where 40%, over 40%, about 42% of Americans make $15 an hour or less. There is not a county in America, not a county in America, where someone who's working hard every day, the kind of job that you don't take a shower in the morning, you take that shower when you come home, you all know what I'm talking about? Hard jobs in restaurants, in factories, hard jobs, like the folks in this hotel who after we leave here are gonna be clearing tables and cleaning bathrooms, hard jobs. <laughs> Like, like those healthcare professionals, like those home healthcare workers, hard jobs. Not a county in America where you can make minimum, where you get paid minimum wage and can afford, afford a two family, a two bedroom apartment. So think about this right now. In New Jersey, you need to make more than twice the minimum wage just to afford raising a family, just to afford rent. And so I want to tell folk here that we are in a crisis in America. Childcare going up, healthcare costs going up. People I know, friends of mine who cut the pills and the life-saving medications they have, prescription drugs in half because they can't afford their life-saving medicine. Cost of college going up. People graduating with so much debt that can't even afford to do the job of their dreams. Why are these teachers revolting in these states? Because they have so much college debt and they're trying to teach, but they can't even live in the communities where they're teaching. We have a crisis in America where people who work hard and play by the rules are falling behind. And we've got to sound the alarm. And one of the great, painful, anguishing signs is what we're here to talk about, which is homelessness. But I want to put this in the context of that vision of what does America stand for and what are we going to do about it? If we know that no change happens waiting on Washington, waiting on president, we've got to decide that we're going to be the change. I could give you more data my, my staff filled up these five index cards with <laughs> all this data. They're like, Corey, talk about the data. And I'm like, I'm talking to folk that know the data. I'm talking to folk that, folk that live the data. But I do like this one. Listen to this one. <laughs> From, the, from almost the time I was born, from 1970 to 2010, my lifetime, rents increased at more than twice the rate of income growth. Think about that. Rents increasing more than twice the rate that incomes were increasing. On average, to rent a two-bedroom apartment, you, need, you would need to earn $21.21. And that's not $15 where 42% of Americans are. Now... 
There was this man named Langston Hughes that called upon folk like us. Like he, he wasn't playing. He, he, he published his poem in 1936, the year my daddy was born. And by the way, if you were born in my daddy's era, despite the sexism and the racism in America during my dad's lifetime, we were, one, we were the best country on earth for social mobility. If you were up in heaven, you would look down on this, on this, 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 this country where 4% of the human beings live and say, that's the best place to be born to make it out of poverty. Well, that idea of America has disappeared. It's better to be born in a number of other countries that have better social mobility than us. We have fallen behind in so many indices. And, and this man in my daddy's era wrote this poem, which was a call to everybody in this room about what we must do. Because I'm this guy that like, I love hearing people, I, you know, my pastor, I was with him this weekend and I'm, but I just have this feeling about what people say. I'm like, before you tell me about your religion, first show it to me and how you treat other people. I, I'm sorry. You can't pray right and walk left. I'm, I just want to call people out. I, I hear, you know, I hear all these people want to praise Jesus and don't understand that Jesus didn't hang out in the C-suites. He hung out with poor folk. But let me tell you something else. Don't be one of these people that puts your hand on your heart and swears an oath, pledges allegiance to this ideal, liberty and justice for all, and not understand that right now that's aspirational and not be a part of making those words real. And so here was this guy, here was this guy who published this poem in 1936 as a challenge to people who swear oaths with their words, but not their actions. And that's why everybody's here today. This is what Langston Hughes said. He said, oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, but yet must be. The land where everyone is free, the poor man, the Indian, the Negro, me. And who made America? Whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must make our mighty dream live again. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, but I swear this oath, America will be. I, I need everybody here. I need everybody here to join me in swearing that oath that we will follow in that tradition of Americans to make this country live up to its promise. Those folks who were in sweatshops with child labor who said this nation will be a nation of workers' rights. Those folks who saw segregation and, and, and the humiliation and said this nation will be a nation of civil rights. Those folks who marched and fought, who met in secret, who put their lives on their lines, who met in barnyards, escaping the law to plot the most important infrastructure project this other country ever had, the Underground Railroad, these are the traditions that we must embody now because the American dream is not advancing, it's losing ground. We now have an obligation to make our founders' ideals live and we can't push it off on somebody else. Miss Virginia Jones taught me that hope, people think, oh, it's tough times and I'm looking for a sign of hope. She's like, no, hope doesn't come from without, it comes from within, that hope is the active conviction that despair will never have the last word. That no matter how bad things get, this woman who lived on the fifth floor of the projects, whose son was murdered in the lobby of the building I would live in for 10, almost 10 years, she never gave up the fight for the ideals of this country and she took the fight to the powerful people because she understood that the power of the people is greater than the people in power. And so, 
I'm going to wrap up with a story, but I just got to tell you, everybody here has to decide that today I've already done a lot. I've already given a lot. I get up every day and fight, Corey, but I got to ask everybody here, what we're doing right now is not enough. It is not enough. Look at the homeless population in this country. It, it, it is morally sinful. It is, makes no economic sense. What it does to a family, what it does to children, what it does to the greatest natural resource this nation has, which is not oil, gas, or coal, but the genius of our children. Look what it does. All the different types of, of homelessness we have, we got to talk about it. We've got to see these people. As Gwendolyn Brooks says, these folks, we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. We belong to each other. Our founders wrote it. They were imperfect people. But at the end of the Declaration of Independence, they talked about a declaration of interdependence. They said, if this nation is truly going to get it, this is how that declaration ends. We must mutually pledge to each other as Americans. We must mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. It falls upon us to lift up that ideal of our founders that we're going to pledge ourselves to each other. That those people who've been rendered invisible that are on the streets of our nation, 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ youth. Overrepresented in our homeless are veterans. Homeless folks who, who are getting evicted because we have criminalized poverty in this nation. People who are doing everything right, but yet they're picked up by the police for doing things that three of the last four presidents admitted to doing. We, we are in a nation with the hypocrisy and, and <laughs> you know, my friend Brian Stevenson says, we have a nation that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than poor and innocent. And it doesn't even make economic sense. I want to argue from the moral position. I want to argue from the disconnect between our ideals as a nation and the reality which we're living. But if you're just a free market person, if you believe in the power of markets and fiscal responsibility and economic conservatism, it doesn't even make sense. The Plymouth Housing Group, I love them in Seattle, Washington. They did a study. They said, let's compare the cost of mentally ill homeless folks that we leave on the streets. Human beings who have dignity and value and worth and things to contribute. What costs more to just leave them on the streets or to put them in affordable, what they call supportive housing? Now I know when you put folk in supportive housing when they can get medication and care and support, they, all of us have something to contribute. And so they compared the cost, 23 people, what costs more? And they found out that those 23 folks, the year they were on the streets versus the year they were in supportive housing, saved Seattle taxpayers a million dollars. 23 people. Why? Because those of us that live in communities like I live in, because folk, I'm the only senator that lives in a low-income community. The median income where I live is about $14,000 per household. Because Ms. Jones, even though she's now passed away, would have me if I ever moved out of the community <laughs> that got, let me got started. I am loyal to my community. Yes, and, and, and what we know who live in communities like that, that it is expensive to be homeless. It's not only a waste of the talent and the genius of people on the streets, those folks will end up in hospital emergency rooms. They'll often be swept into jails as we criminalize poverty. And that's more costly. We have this nation that seems to want to pay more on the back end of problems than making smart investments on the front end. And, and so before I end, that's my call to action here. 
please don't just come here today and then go home. Go to the hill today. Get up and please get up in the face of some Congress people and tell them, look, I'm advocating for easy stuff. It's not complicated. I I've got a bill that just says, hey, in the United States of America, it costs more to be evicted, to bring your family on the street. Let's just do something simple. I have a bill in that says, hey, let's for, for those Americans, which is of renters, the majority darn near, who pay over 30% of their income, one in four qualify, one in four, only one in four of whom who qualify for housing assistance get it. Let's expand the earned income tax credit. Let's give them a tax credit to cover those rent. Common sense solutions. We, we have towns which have the best schools, best resources that create this restrictive zoning to keep poor people out. You all know this. We're, we're moving poor people out of communities, out of cities. They can't afford to live because it's a requirement. If you have a house, you gotta have so many acres or they, they say no multifamily units. And so what happens? We create poverty away from communities. So now not only do you have to pay so much of your income in housing away from where the good schools are and the opportunities are, but then you gotta pay not only the rent, but the commuting cost to get to work. You see, we seem to be compounding problems instead of solving them. You gotta go and talk to your legislators because dealing with homelessness, ending homelessness is not some fantasy it's not some crazy dream. We have the tools and the capacity to end homelessness in America. It's not a matter of can we, it's a matter of do we have the collective will? And so we should go. If we can prioritize trillions of dollars of tax cuts for corporations who trust me, didn't need our help. If we could give trillion, blow holes in our deficits to help the wealthiest of the wealthy, the true wealth in our country is in the communities like we live in. And you should get in the face of your Congress people and tell them about common sense solutions. And then let me tell you the second thing. This one gets me upset. <laughs> then you gotta go home and register some folk to vote. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be blunt about this. You can't complain about America if you're not voting in America. I, I'm telling you, I, I, in 2008, I go to vote. It's a line around my polling place. Barack Obama's on the ballot, everybody. I, it was like this, and I was mayor of Newark then. And I, when I was mayor of Newark, unlike now, I used to roll deep. I had this SUV, I had police officers. I roll up to the end of the line. This is Newark. I know we're from a lot of communities across this country. One thing I love about my city is we keep it real. <laughs> so the woman at the end of the line didn't look at me and say, hi, Mayor, how you doing? What a historic day. I'm voting for Barack Obama. And, 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 and instead, she just looks at me approaching with my police officers and everything, looks at me and she goes, don't you think you're cutting in this line now? <laughs> I don't care who you are. You ain't special. <laughs> You're gonna wait like the rest of us. And I'm, I got these police officers, I'm the mayor of the city. I look at this woman and I go, yes, ma'am. <laughs> One year later, I go to vote. One year later, it is the governor's election in New Jersey. Y'all don't know my last governor. There's a man named Chris Christie. Y'all don't know him. Never heard of him, I know. He is challenging an incumbent Democrat. I go, to, I go to vote. Nobody's at the polling place. I walk in the polling center, one of the first people to vote, but first thing I did is walk in, walk around the table, hug the poll worker because she looked lonely. <laughs> and then guess what happened? Policy priorities are made. Elections have consequences. Next thing you know, they're cutting the earned income tax credit, cutting funding to cities. Affordable housing funding is getting cut. And everybody's running around saying, why are they doing this to us? All oh, those Republicans, they wanna heap negativity, heap anger, heap hatred on these folks on the other cross of the aisle. I'm sorry, I'm a boy raised in a small community church. I don't wanna hate anybody because I know the truth. Martin Luther King said it, he said, what we have to repent for in our day and age is not the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, it's the appalling silence and inaction of the good people.
I, I need everybody here to remember, you can write them down if you want, the 10 two-letter words. I want you to think about them every day when you get angry about something that's going on, when you feel yourself sitting down at home getting all upset. Sometimes I'm sitting there watching Rachel at night and I'm getting all upset. I'm caught up in this, this state of sedentary agitation. <laughs> yelling at my TV. Somebody should do something about this. <laughs> and then I'm like, wait a minute, I'm a United States Senator. <laughs> but history tells us it is not up to the senators or the president. It's up to the power of the people. And the sin is when people think that democracy is a spectator sport and you can sit on the sideline cheering for your team, blue or red, and think that that's what creates change. Those 10 two-letter words, write them down if you need it, that you should think about every day. You should think about when you get angry. You should think about it when you're ending homelessness. You should think about it when you're ending discrimination against folk or gay and lesbians. Discrimination against folk who are poor. Discrimination against folks who are struggling with illness, think about those 10 two-letter words. If it is to be, it is up to me. And so I end with the story. I end with this story, which I told four years ago when y'all invited me. <laughs> but I tell it because this person is in the room. The spirit of this person's in the room. But if I walk around tables and hugged folks and shook hands, I would, I would greet this person because so many of you live this spirit. I mentioned his name earlier. His name is Frank Hutchins. And I want to get back to this issue of vision and, and, and oh, say, can you see? So Frank, I met him. He was an elderly guy when I met him. And I started as that young lawyer. He adopted me. He had an organization then. He had many names of his organization over time, but now it was called the HUD Tenants Coalition. He would fight the federal government, the state government, the local government. In the 1970s, he led the longest rent strike in Newark's history at Stella Wright Homes, took on and beat the federal government, the public housing authority, got people back money paid for living in unconscionable conditions. This man fought battles, but you would meet him. He wasn't a guy that could stand up and give a fancy speech. He wasn't a guy that would suck the oxygen out of the room. He was kind and gentle and humble, but a ferocious fighter for justice. So many people were affected by this man and him taking on slumlords. And now he and I were taking on slumlords. We were preparing a lawsuit against the owner of Brick Towers, the buildings I would move into. This guy was straight out of central casting as a slumlord. And I was all excited and we had our first tenant meeting where we put the word out. We needed to collect information about people's conditions so that I could write the information down, put it in the complaint and get it. So we're sitting in the basement of these buildings. There's a, people, a bunch of people in front sitting behind a table looking all official, lawyers, me. But Frank was sitting at the end of the table on the side and people started coming up to the microphone and telling their story and I'm scribbling away. Now for the first 10, 20 minutes, for the first half hour, first hour, I'm eagerly doing it, but come on, by the hour and a half, I'm just getting, I got all I need, but why? You know, people get up on that microphone, sometimes they don't want, they want to give a sermon or tell the truth and some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and, and yet, yet, as people are talking about the conditions in which they live, the horrors, the effect on their family, the effect on their children, the effect on their job, the effect on their physical health, Frank looked at every person that came up as if they were the first speaker. He looked at every person that come up as if they were the only person in the room. He looked at every person that came up, his eyes seemed to project love. I'm getting antsy and, you know, complaining in my head, but he it's evidencing this ideal that is so important I learned from it. You cannot lead the people if you don't love the people. And so by the end of the night, by the end of the night, people who come up to the mic, they're not looking in front of the room. Guess where they're looking? They're looking right at Frank. The end of the, end of the night, and remember, I'm young, impetuous. I make some crack to him about how long the meeting was, complaining to him about this, that. And he just stops and very gently says to me, Corey, we're not there just to try to help folk heal those buildings. We're trying to heal a community. 
This is one of the only opportunities people have to tell their truth, to let their pain be known to the community. How toxic it is to, for people to have to suffer these indignities and, and, and not to be able to air them and share them. He went on to just tell me about the importance in this country for us to know each other, for us to see each other, for us to love each other. And you cannot love God, that word has been so cheapened. We, we've changed our society to be this nation that aspires for tolerance. You try saying that to somebody in your family. I tolerate you. <laughs> uh, come on. America is called to love. Patriotism is love of country, and you cannot love your country unless you love your fellow countrymen and women. And, 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 and Frank lived this ideal. You can't love someone unless you see them, unless you listen to them, unless you know them. And the challenge with this country is we've rendered so many people and their daily struggles, good people, hardworking people, we've rendered their struggles invisible. Frank got older and he was one of the people that told me to run for city councilman. I won that office. Frank still was aging. Eventually, he helped me become mayor of the city of Newark. But now his health was fading and his eyesight went. And I would go to him, I'd knock on the door, he'd open the door, and I knew he didn't know who was there. And I would say, Frank, it's Corey. He'd be like, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> and I got ridiculous. I would just start laughing when he would say that. But that became our thing. I would come to pick him up to go grocery shop and knock on his door. He'd open up and I'd say, Frank, it's Corey. And he'd be like, I see you. And so it became our thing. Frank, it's Corey. I see you. Take him out to the... One day he's like, Corey, I want to go to the movies. And I'm like, Frank, you can't see. And he's like, this, Corey, wake up. I, I want to sit there and listen and enjoy and luxuriate in the rich sounds of the movie. And I'll enjoy it more than you will. And he did. He got a little older, a little sicker. And now he was in hospice. And, and I confess this to you, and don't judge me too much, but this is my ego and my ego problems. Because I was visiting him in hospice as his health was declining, as he was getting closer and closer to being called home to glory. And I, my ego, was upset that there weren't hundreds of people visiting this man because he was personally responsible for thousands of people, generations of folks, having a roof over their head having affordable housing, having heat and hot water in the winter. This guy touched so many lives. And my ego was like, why isn't people here? But you know, Frank taught me in the last days and hours of his life what life is all about. He, 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 his life wasn't about popularity. It was about purpose. It wasn't about celebrity. It was about living a life of significance. It wasn't about how many people show up when you die. It's about how many people you show up for while you are living. I, I'm telling you right now, one of the most meaningful moments of my life was the last time I would see Frank. Those incredible healthcare workers, working hard jobs, they saw me, I became friends with some of them as I was coming and going, and they told me that day that Frank wouldn't be long. I, I walk into his room, his breath is short and shallow, he was struggling, he really couldn't speak, but when I opened the door and I announced myself like I always did, Frank, it's Corey. He struggled to force out our greeting. I see you. I went to his bedside, pulled up a chair. I held his hand. I talked to him. I, I knew this was probably going to be the last time, so I told him my feelings, my love. I told him how grateful I was for his life. And at the end, I kiss him on the forehead, kiss him on the cheek. And with everything I had, I just simply say, I, Frank, I love you. And Frank, 
he, he said nothing the whole time. He forces those words out. He forces those words out. I love you. I left his room and, and it was the last time I saw him. And I, I think about those words when I'm back home. And I get angry sometimes. When Shahad Smith was murdered on my street by an assault weapon. And nobody, it wasn't national news. Another black kid killed in an inner city. I think about when these incredible human beings meet across the street from where I live in a drug treatment center, struggling with the disease of addiction. I, I sit with them. I've sat with them times and listened to their stories, listened to their struggles, listened to their truth, and I try to look at them like Frank would have looked at with them, looked at them. And I worry that we don't see them. On my block, there's affordable housing that people wait on lines to, to get into, and it's not worthy of their dignity. The conditions are unconscionable. Why don't people see them? I think about Frank's words. I see you. I love you. I see you. I love you. I see you. I love you. We in this room need to reawaken that American spirit that we see each other for who we are, that we share a common dignity, that we share a common destiny, that we share a common origins created equally, that we are bound together by spirit we are bound together by history, that there is no future for some Americans, not other. There's no red future or no blue future, no Democrat future, no Republican future. There's just one American future. And we will never get there if we don't see each other. And that's where we must be together in this room to wake folk up, to make them look and see the unfinished business of America, make them confront the beauty that exists in the shadow places, make them know that we are one people, one destiny. Like the old African saying says, if you want to go fast, yeah, go alone. But if you want to go far, you must go together. And so I, I call on folk in this room to be like our ancestors before us, from Frederick Douglass and Fannie Lou Hamer, from, 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 from Ella Baker and Martin Luther King, from leaders of the past, it's now our turn, from the foot soldiers of movements past, labor movements, women's rights movements, it's now time for the movement of human dignity. It's now time for the, human, the movement of economic prosperity. It is now time for the movement for once and for all to end homelessness. And if we choose to accept that right now, we will be the nation that lives up to its promise of liberty and justice for all, that lives up to its promise that all are created equally that lives up to its promises and finally is for every single American, the home of the brave. Thank you.